Hi, everyone. Welcome to week one of How to Unfuck Your Future. Hopefully you had a chance to see Ral's kickoff piece on the platform. If you feel like it's harder and harder to get ahead, you're not crazy. Rao lays out some of the really hard truths about what's really happening in the global economy and talks about how debt, demographics, and deflation are creating an economic crisis the likes of which we have never seen. These issues are also creating political pressures. We're seeing a rise in populism, social unrest, and war. Add to that mix artificial intelligence and more than 50 elections happening around the world this year, and you have a cocktail for some real volatility. To discuss the outlook and figure out how this plugs into the series, we are joined by two of the very best in the business, Dee Smith, CEO of Strategic Insight Group, and Jacob Shapiro, the Director of Geopolitical Analysis at Cognitive Investments. Um, Fellas, I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think this is something that's on all of our minds. We're all kind of stressed out about it, trying to figure it out. And it feels like there are a lot of different things that are happening. Um, Dee, I'm going to hand it off to you. Um, I'll come back a little bit later for questions, but I just wanted to remind everyone, if you are joining us live and you have a question or comment, you can drop it in the live chat as always. Um, We also want you to share your thoughts throughout this two-week series we're doing. So we've created a special channel on the platform. You can find it either in the link on the homepage when you first go on the platform, or when you log in, you can go to the globe page, the network page, and then look on the bottom right and you'll find that. So feel free to post your comments um, and thoughts in there as well. Dee, take it away. Well, thank you, Maggie. And, and you know, if you're really looking forward to this, you must have a taste for the scary and the macabre. And we'll try not to uh, disappoint. Um, but uh, um, let me start by apologizing, apologizing for my hacking away. Um, spring has sprung here in Texas and it's taking its toll on me. But that's just where we are. Um, Jacob, it's great to see you again. Uh, the world has changed, uh, not in a good way, since the last time we spoke on Real Vision. It's, as Maggie just explained, it's gotten a lot more volatile. Um, Problems have not gotten better, gotten worse. Um, New problems have popped up. And, you know, for every new thing that is lauded as some kind of a a panacea or some with enormous opportunities, and I, I do think those exist, it has a, the other side too, uh, AI being the obvious obvious <clears throat> example. So let's pan out and start big and then narrow down today. And uh, I would like to discuss what is behind the the VUCA world. You know, there's this term, the VUCA, volatile, uncertain, uh, complex, and um, um, ambiguous. What do you see as behind this? what are, are there any unifying factors? And I've got some ideas, but I'd love to hear yours first. Well, the, the first thing I'll say is I'm going to uh, pose myself as the optimistic contrarian, a position that you often get to take. But I don't find myself depressed or stressed about this world at all. In fact, I see lots of opportunity. I see lots of good things happening. I think one thing that is happening is the way that the media environment is getting shaped Uh, And the way that our psychologies work is that we gravitate towards the bad news. We want to chase the headlines where something bad is happening. It's like junk food for our brains. But there was an article in Nature magazine just last year where psychologists documented this trend and documented this trend over decades, where even three, four decades ago, people were saying the world was going to hell in a handbasket. Everything is terrible. And But the interesting thing was when they looked backwards, um, you know, 10, 20 years from where they were in the present moment... (laughs) They forgot about all the bad times. And I have a sneaking suspicion that when we're sitting here 20 years from now, D, and we're looking back at the 2020s, we'll talk about how good life was in the 2020s and how really it's the 2040s that we need to sort of get away from ourselves from. Um, But besides that sort of broader point, no, I think there is one unifying theme. And it's something I've been talking about for a couple of years. And I will admit that it's accelerated far quicker than I thought it would. Some of it was accelerated by the pandemic. Certainly, Vladimir Putin's decisions have accelerated uh, the world I'm going to describe here, but it's a multipolar geopolitical environment. And that world might feel scary because so many of us, really all of us, have either lived in a unipolar world where the U.S. was the dominant power in the world or a bipolar world, which is not, I don't mean to say it was a crazy world. I mean to say it was the United States on one side and the Soviet Union on the other side, democracy 
versus authoritarianism, capitalism versus communism. Um, the last time you get a truly multipolar geopolitical environment is the 1890s, and it's replete with rising and falling great powers and energy transitions and fundamentally different ways of thinking about everything from the family unit to what the nation state actually means. And the thing is, for most of history, that's how it works. It is not normal to have one power that dominates the entire world. I mean, maybe you could throw the British Empire in there. That's it. There's no other power that has had the relative power the United States has had over the last 30 to 40 years. And as we see that transition away from the United States playing that very historically anomalous role to a more normal environment where you have countries that are in blocks against each other and some are competing and some are allied and everybody is sort of pragmatic and horse trading at the end. I think that's why you have um, all of this volatility in the system. But for me, volatility is a good thing. It means there's opportunity. It means that there's change. And I think the silver lining in all of this is that there is no one power or group of powers that wants to really truly challenge the status quo quite yet. Now, if you go 20, 30 years down the road on this trajectory, sure, like then we can start creating nightmare scenarios. But just look at the Russia-Ukraine war. It's still the Russia-Ukraine war. There's no NATO involvement. There's no World War III. It's just a Russia-Ukraine war. It's terrible if you're in Ukraine. But beyond that, it really hasn't affected very much. Look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that has mushroomed into a war in the Middle East. In October, everybody was talking again, World War III. Oh my God, everything is going to hell in a handbasket. It hasn't. It's an Israeli-Palestinian affair. Yes, the Houthis are shooting off some missiles in the Red Sea, but every single state actor, whether it's Iran or whether it's Turkey or whether it's Saudi Arabia or whether it's has been trying to push against interstate conflict. So it really falls to these proxy groups to express some sort of volatility in the global system. So I think that's the broad shift that we're living through. We're living through that shift from a unipolar world to a multipolar world. And while it does create all of these pockets of instability and volatility, I think it also creates opportunity. And I think it also creates change of a good sort, which is exactly right. Artificial intelligence, the energy transition, um, all sorts of advances in biotech. Uh, and in crop science and things like that. So if you care to look past the junk food of the headlines, I think there are good things going on, even if at that top level, um, the media is serving us, uh, you know, the, the Big Mac of war here, war there, and everything is terrible. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of <clears throat> Mark Twain's comment that, um, it, that he, he constructed a, a newspaper and, and there was always a uh, revolution in Central America. There was always conflict yeah. in Europe. There was a, and this was, you know, 150 years ago. <clears throat> so, yes, that, that is correct. And, it, and um, you know, I think the, the attraction of very um, negative news goes a lot farther back than a few decades. I think it's programmed into us by evolution because it was always better to think that the movement in the grass when you were on the savannah was a lion than not to the ones who who thought that survived better than the ones who ignored it so yeah we are we are entirely programmed to uh to to give extra consideration to negative news that doesn't mean however that there are not times that are better and times that are worse and um you know the time you describe in the 1890s of multipolarity uh, is it is also known as balance of power politics, geopolitics. And it's highly unstable because everybody's jockeying for power. And um, and and of course, what that period led to was World War I and World War II, which I see as two bookends of the same war. <clears throat> and, you know, they say that that World War um the three has has started, but it's a hot war in cold places, you know, underwater and the Arctic and space and so forth. Uh, so, you know, we don't really know. Um, I, I, I do appreciate your optimism. <clears throat> and I do think that that technology uh, it has all sorts of very interesting things that do hold a lot of promise. Um, my concern is for the human nature of the people who control them. You know, Dan, Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, made a very interesting point um, very recently. And he said that the thing about AI is that it is not anywhere near consciousness or even really sentience at this point. And it, and it probably won't be for a very long time, if ever. But what it can do is fool us into thinking that it is sentient and conscious 
and therefore can be used by bad actors to manipulate people. And, you know, I think this is to just to hone in on a topic here. You know, I, I, I think you would agree that we've seen a, a, a significant rise in authoritarianism and various non-democratic or, or you know, false democracy type um uh, rule in the in the world uh, and it you know uh, the rise of authoritarian figures and uh, you know that was not the trend that we thought <clears throat> would be happening 20 years ago um or certainly at the fall of the berlin wall what do you think accounts for that rise in in um in interest in 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 in, in desire for and and putting in place allowing to come into place let's say authoritarian regimes um, in the present moment. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to do a deeper study to figure out if there has been more authoritarianism rising over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, but I think what you can say is that there was an expectation from the West and the West led by the United States that economic progress and specifically the fruits of globalization were going to lead to the spread of liberal democracy. I mean, that everybody thought, for instance, that China by joining and becoming a part of the global economy was also going to become a liberal democracy. And I think that was somewhat of a delusion. I think the United States was guilty of thinking, oh, the Cold War has been won. Capitalism is ascendant. Our version of freedom and democracy is ascendant. It is going to spread everywhere because what else could people possibly want? Now, there were hints of challenges to this during the heady times of the 90s. Um, you know, Osama bin Laden didn't start uh, with September 11th, 2001. You had the rise of global jihadism as a force in the early 1990s and really building to a crescendo around 2001. Vladimir Putin took over Russia in the late 1990s um, and, you know, confounded multiple U.S. leaders into thinking that he was somebody who wanted liberal. When it was very clear all he wanted was to put together under his own rule. And he started telling us that with the invasion of Georgia in 2008 and the first invasion of Ukraine in 2014. So in some sense, it wasn't surprising that Russia decided to stick to its roots and, and go backwards there. So I think what has happened, and I think what you can ascribe to the rise of maybe populist uh, politicians or the rise of leaders who are willing to use fear um, in order to achieve power and then expand power, is that globalization was doing what it was supposed to do. It was driving down the cost of goods. It was creating um, economic progress and economic growth throughout the world. But even the greatest advocates of free trade will be the first to tell you that one of the consequences of free trade, especially in its early innings for developing countries, is inequality and an increase in, in inequality in general. And you can see this even in the hegemon in the United States. We have seen wealth inequality. It's actually pulled back a little bit since the pandemic, probably somewhat to do with the, the stimulus payments. But I think it's broader based than that. I think you can point to productivity gains and labor shortages and things like that. But if you look at if you map sort of globalization onto wealth inequality in the United States, starting in the 90s and the 2000s with this unipolar era, it starts to go up. And while people are getting wealthier and while the cost of goods are going down, other people are losing their jobs. Entire industries are being wiped out because they're being outsourced to China or to India. And now you have pockets of angry voters who their livelihoods have been destroyed. The government is not supporting retraining them in any meaningful way. And they're just stuck out there in a sort of endless doom loop and looking for someone who they feel like speaks to them. And I think you're seeing this in democracies and authoritarian regimes throughout the world. Um, China has not been a democracy by any stretch of the imagination since the Communist Party took over, but it was a little bit more democratic until she took over in 2013 and 2014. And his clarion call and the reason why Xi Jinping is popular in China is because he's going after corruption. He's going after the wealthy coastal elites and redistributing wealth and telling all those poor people in the interior of China. All right, we're going to spread that wealth finally. It's going to come to you. You're not going to be left behind. Inequality is not going to continue visiting, its, visiting itself upon you. And I think that's also perhaps one reason why um, 2024 feels so pregnant with stress and, the, and that a shadow is hanging over it. Because even if I'm right about this multipolar world emerging, the United States is still the most powerful country in the world and the most influential. Even if that relative power and influence has begun to decline, it is still the top dog. And there is so much uncertainty in the United States today. Uh, in some sense, this year has been really, for me, geopolitically, a holding pattern because everybody's looking at the United States and trying to figure out, well, is it going to be Biden? Is it going to be Trump? Are one or both of them going to slip on a banana peel and it's going to be somebody completely new? Like, what's going to happen? And when you have that level of uncertainty, 
And that level of just diametrically opposed viewpoints of who's going to be in the White House, um, you know, Trump enunciating a very, very protectionist sort of policy that is not in keeping with what the Biden administration has been pursuing over the past couple of years, you get that sense of unease and you get countries that are trying, I wouldn't say, I don't think World War III is happening at all. I know that uh, Pippa Malmgren, for instance, likes to talk about that a lot, and I would love to debate her on it. I, I think you see countries that are positioning for great power competition, and I think you see lots of positioning in the world. You see positioning just this year in, in regards to response to the election. Um, but, and I think maybe that is part of the unease because so many different countries in the world are not sure what the United States is going to do. And depending on what that election result gives us, probably you'll see moves in one direction or the other. But my my best attempt at an answer to your very important and very honestly complex question, D, is I think globalization was its own worst enemy. It led to a rise in inequality and inequality led to an expression of populist and demagogic politicians. And those politicians are the ones that are making decisions, whether in democracies or whether uh, more firmly established in authoritarian realms. You know, I don't disagree with anything you said. Um, I, I might look at it from a different standpoint, uh, but I certainly agree we're in a multipolar reality and it's becoming more multipolar. And you have, uh, you know, the decline of um, uh, of the old powers. Um, and, and that's true not only uh, of the U.S. And, and Russia, which is not what it was or what we believed it to be. It's also true of China, which is, you know, heading heavy sledding, as they say, in uh, uh, economically and in a number of other ways that are going to make it very difficult for Xi to to fulfill these promises that that he's made. But the you also have the rise of the middle powers, you know, places like Iran, Turkey, um, Brazil. And and those are, you know, taking uh, India, certainly an obvious one. And, and some of those may become much more powerful. They're huge countries with enormous resources. And, um, you know, the, the multipolarity, I think, and I, I agree with you about people looking at the United States and wanting it to lead. The problem, I think, is that we're not in a structural position to do that in the way that we did any longer. And I'll give you a, an example, which is um, is relative strength in terms of the military. And while the U.S., you know, it's often said, is certainly the largest military and the most we spend more money on on uh, military spending than any other country, uh, m more than many countries combined. But we are we have lost the edge that we had. <clears throat> and I was talking to someone in the military the other day, and and who was telling me some of the things he'd heard from you know the military leaders talk to each other around the world, which is a very good thing. <laughs> but he, he said that you know. The attitude 15 years ago or so was you just didn't want to tangle with the United States. You, you, you would get your ass handed to you. And, uh, and so people just, you know, you, you, could, you could quell a conflict by just bringing in an aircraft carrier. And he said the attitude today is not quite that. It's that, you know, we, maybe we can tangle with them and win. And they're so uh, um, distracted by other things. And you know that uh, they're they, they just don't have the technology. Other people have caught up, and um, you know the the ad admission that we don't. For instance, we're having a hard time making a hypersonic missile work, and that's a whole other topic because you know what it means is a is a, a guided hypersonic missile as opposed to an ICBM. They all they both travel at hypersonic speeds, but uh, there is a. There's a perception, a growing perception, I think, and not just in military affairs, that the U.S. has passed its prime. And, you know, I am interested in cyclical theories of history, and I do think that nations and companies like people have a life cycle. And I, But I also think they can be renewed. But it's a, a difficult um, situation when people are expecting you to be able to to endlessly do things, and you know, I'm, it, my understanding is that if if we got into a real three front, front war, we couldn't do it. For one thing, we're already running out of materiel because we've sent so much to Ukraine, and uh, and it's it's very difficult. And a lot of these 
advanced armaments are, are still made by hand. So, you know, there's just a whole <clears throat> range of issues leaving aside economic issues that have to do with debt and, uh, and, and the, the crushing load of debt, not only, um, you know, government debt, but corporate debt and personal debt uh, in this country. And of course, you know, what debt is fundamentally, and I think people don't think about this, debt is a bet on, it's borrowing from the future to pay for the present. And it's a bet that the future is going to be richer than the present. And when that doesn't happen, it creates a world of hurt. And, um, you know, you have to believe, as you do, um, that, that, you know, we'll innovate our way out of this and that technology is so promising that it will provide that fuel in the future. Uh, I mean, mon monetary fuel in the future. Uh, and uh, I think it's a great attitude. I just question whether it's accurate. And, you know, I, I question, and then I think the third element that is, is perhaps the most um, telling of all, and talked about that um, to some extent, but uh, is, is the, the general attitude, the, the, uh, the general emotional state, psychological state of, of, of Americans uh, in terms of, of where this country is going. And, and I think the rise of complexity and the rise of fear has um, has taken people to a darker place. And, um, you know, uh, I was actually talking to someone who's head of a major corporation. I, I can't t say who, but, and he told me they'd done a study. It was, it's a manufacturing company. And and uh, that 82% of the uh, of the decline in, in manufacturing jobs, blue collar, jo collar jobs, it is due over the last 20 years is due to automation. It's not that globalization took those jobs overseas. It, it did to some extent, and particularly in the earlier part of it. But automation is 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 doing that, and and with AI, it's coming for white collar jobs. And so, you know, we we don't we're not prepared for that. We haven't thought how we're going to deal with it. We've we tried an experiment during the pandemic, which was a, a kind of um, universal general income, a little bit of that, and it. It doesn't really work if you want people to stay working and stay innovative and so forth. They they get comfortable and 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 don't. It, it just doesn't. It doesn't happen that that they they you know keep their noses to the grindstone. So you know in in all of this, I think the 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 real culprit is human nature, and um, and the question I think is, are we do the things that we see have to do with with just human nature, or do they have equally, or perhaps more, to do with culture and and how how we're um, driven to think in certain ways by the stories we tell ourselves and the cultures that we uh, that we create, and um, and and that question is going to determine a lot of the future because if it's human nature. It, it, you know, we are in a lot worse position. If it's culture, if it can be changed to some extent, then we we there's there's some uh, there's some hope that you know we that the world you're talking about can come into into being. Let me stop there and 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 um, and get your reaction to that and uh, um, and just you know I, I I'm very interested in all the points you brought up. I just I, I, you know, I'm glad you're an, an optimist, even though H. L. Mencken said optimists make, optimists make life so miserable for the rest of us. But uh, <laughs> in any event, um, please. Yeah, yep. D. There, there's so much to break apart in what you just said, and I would call myself a contrarian first and an optimist second. So I will almost always invariably take the opposite of whatever side I'm being fed. So if I'm being spoon fed death and destruction, I will probably spit out optimism. And if I'm being fed optimism, I'll probably spit out death and destruction. So if you're looking for my bias, uh, viewers, that's exactly where it is. Um, and I'll also just say, I'll, I'll date myself as somebody, I'm a geriatric millennial. I'm sort of in that elder millennial generation. And it's we're angry at um, our politicians and that older generations, precisely because they're borrowing from the future to pay for the things that they want right now. It's not, we're not angry because the price of avocado toast has increased by two or three times. We're angry because we see all the debt that's being racked up 
fact, even when we get to the age that the the boomers and others are right now, that there's going to be nothing left for us because we've we've already borrowed everything. So, at least on that level, um, it, it rains home. But I want to start. Uh, by responding to um, what you said about the U.S. military edge. And I think even in your comments about it, you demonstrate um, how the U.S. is sort of getting things wrong here and how U.S. adversaries are successfully testing the United States. And let's let's start with the Houthis and the Red Sea. I think when we look back at 2024, when historians look back at this year, um, probably the most important thing that will have happened was that the much vaunted U.S. Navy with its nine aircraft carriers and everything else could not reopen shipping in the Red Sea because a ragtag militia of Houthis supported by Iran were able to completely disrupt container shipping in that part of the world. I mean, it's sort of amazing. And the way that they're doing it is they're using drones that cost maybe a couple tens of thousands of dollars. And the only recourse the United States seems to have is these missiles that cost millions of dollars to produce. You talk about the problem with the United States and how we can't produce hypersonic missiles. The problem with the United States is it doesn't have a missile that is cheap to produce that can knock out these drones. Um, the problem for the United States is we don't, we've already sent all the artillery ammunition we can to the Ukrainians. There's nothing left. We don't, we don't build those sort of low-end things that are cheap, but which they actually need in some of these fights. One of the most remarkable statistics I've seen in the last 12 months is that North Korea has shipped more artillery ammunition to Russia than Europe has to Ukraine over the past 12 months. I mean, just sort of mind-blowing. And this is not stuff that you need that needs to be super advanced. This is just basic artillery shells, basic bullets. We've lost the ability to make these things in part because we believed the myth of globalization. We believed everybody was going to join the WTO and hold hands and sing Kumbaya and buy cheap iPhones. And that world has certainly not emerged. Um, I think you're also exactly right to point out that the United States, um, from sort of a strategic perspective, has lost the thread. And whether that's a top-down issue, um, whether the government is sort of not seeing things correctly, or whether it's a bottoms-up issue, and whether Americans are just um, as apathetic as they are famous for being. And I think you can see this, I mean, is one example of it. I think you can see it in the way that the United States, on the one hand, it wants to open up more markets and wants to export U.S. goods and U.S. influence and things like that. And yet we are strong arming, not enemies, but allies like the Dutch or the Japanese or the South Koreans and saying, hey, you can't trade with China anymore. We're going to restrict your companies from trading with countries that we don't like. And if you don't do it, you're going to get sanctions just like everybody else. Those things don't work. There's you know, this huge debate over TikTok in the last couple of weeks. It is remarkable to me that the United States is behaving basically like a thug. We don't like TikTok. So, hey, Chinese company ByteDance, if you don't divest this and give it to U.S. company, we're going to come after you with sanctions. That's thuggish behavior. That's not free market capitalism. That's not laissez-faire and let the market figure out how things work. And we're trying to have our cake and eat it too. Um, and I think one of the the... The things here to take away from this is you're also exactly right. The United States cannot be all things to all people. We cannot fight three front wars. Even at the zenith of our power, I'm not sure that we could have fought um, three front wars. We're going to have to be a little bit more choosy about what is important to us. We are not going to be the most dominant power in the world. And that means specific things. For example, let's, let's think about the Middle East for a second and the Israeli-Palestinian and the war in the Middle East. It shouldn't matter to the United States strategically. The only reason the Middle East ever mattered to the United States was because we got dependent on the Saudis and the other Gulf countries for oil. And we had to sort of do this deal with the devil in the 1970s where we sent them weapons and they sent us oil and we were friends with authoritarian regimes that had nothing in common with liberal democracy, had nothing in common with our culture. We went after Cuba and Venezuela and China and some of these other countries, but we're willing to buddy up with the Saudis. I mean, they have a record that is just as reprehensible as any of the other dictatorships that I just mentioned here, if you want to be really blunt about it. But we needed their oil. As a result of the shale revolution, we don't need their oil anymore. You know who needs their oil? China, India, Japan, South Korea. Why should we care about stability in the Middle East? It doesn't matter to us anymore. Maybe the Chinese should get involved. Maybe they should experience the headaches that we've experienced over the past four to five decades and bringing stability to a region that they are actually dependent on. The places where the United States needs to focus more, number one is our own backyard, where Central America, it's funny you bring up the Mark Twain anecdote, but Central America is on fire. Haiti's prime minister can't even get back into the country because gangs have taken over the capital. Uh, the former president of Honduras, who we backed while he was in office, we just sentenced him to a life sentence in a U.S. jail. 
Um, Mexico has illegal migration going up and a protectionist, probably a, a, the election of a protectionist president to follow up from AMLO. So we've got some thinking to do in our own backyard. And second of all, the major strategic issue is the Pacific. And so maybe we should have some really concrete strategic conversations about will we defend Taiwan or won't we? Will we defend the Philippines with whom we have a defense treaty or won't we? And make that allocating resources and military development and things like that with those things in mind. None of that is happening. It is all fly by the seat of our pants. Let's pass this tax. Let's argue about who can go into which bathroom. Let's legislate all these stupid fights when we have real strategic priorities that we need to decide on. And I think the last thing I would just say, I mean, this is sort of separate, but it was it was what you closed on, and I can't resist commenting on it, this idea of experimenting with the universal income as a result of the COVID-19 stimulus payments. Um, I'm not going to get into whether I agree with it politically or not. I, I try to stay above like my own political opinions. I will just say, as a result, at least of some of the stimulus payments, we did see a reduction in wealth inequality in this country and a reduction in child poverty. Now, that might not be the right policy tool to affect those things. Maybe it's not sustainable. Maybe it's sort of a one-off and that will disappear in the data in the coming years because as you said, it doesn't lead to work or product, these other things. But I don't think it's so black and white. And I think for the richest country in the world and the strongest country in the world to have a conversation about ways that we could try to fix child poverty and try to fix wealth inequality because despite how rich and powerful we have been, we haven't really made significant progress on those issues in the last couple of decades. Like maybe those are the things we should actually be talking about. But much harder to sell a newspaper with, you know, House House Committee hearing on the various policies to try and reduce child poverty. Give us, give us Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift and Donald Trump versus Biden, and apparently that's what sells the papers. No question. I think we're having a heated agreement because uh, I, I I agree with all of the things you said. I would add, um, you know, I, central. You're exactly right, and I, you know, I work globally, but I'm a Latin Americanist by by avocation and by by background, <clears throat> and so I'm very aware of these things. And I think what people, you know, and, and something we haven't talked about, either of us, is migration, displaced persons and that sort of thing. And um, and that is becoming a real crisis uh, for several reasons. And the U.S. is the, is the you know, ne plus ultra destination. It's the place that people want to come to. And what I think a lot of people don't realize is it's it's better known here in Texas, but is that the the most of the people, uh, a sizable portion of the people on the Texas border and on the U.S. border with Mexico are not Mexicans and are not even mm -hmm. from Central America. And, uh, uh, you know, there is a uh, this has been studied by a friend of mine. There is a, a fascinating and, and disturbing kind of train, Underground Railroad, I guess they would have called it in the in the old days, that starts in Chile. And it goes all the way up the spine of the Americas uh, into and into the U.S. And the way it works is that every single um, mayor and police chief and so forth in all these little towns that that people are taken through, who pay a lot of money, by the way, they're mostly middle class people because it costs thirty to fifty thousand dollars to to get yourself on you know up to the United States and into the United States. So all these people are taken through these towns and and in every case you know the police chief and the mayor and a few other officials get a dollar for each one that goes through let's say. And and then there's so many that go through that becomes a significant amount of money. And it is now it, uh it, it's it's innate in the system. It's it's part of their the way they live. And so it, and it, it's a perfect example of corruption, but it, it's, um, it's so pervasive that it, and I've had some really intensive discussions with people uh, who, who are, you know, much better informed about it than I am. How do you deal with that? How do you actually, once it becomes part of the local economy, without replacing it with some other money, how do you actually, um, uh, you know, root it out? And it's not clear. Nobody has that answer. And but it, people continue to to fly or, or by boat come from the Middle East, Europe, Africa, Asia uh, to the to Ch Chile and, and southern South America and, and, and move on this thing up. And that system I described of the mayors and the and the, and the police chiefs and so forth 
goes not only up to the U.S. border, it goes into the U.S. It goes inside the U.S. border. So it's it's here in this country, too. And so, you know, you're looking at about 70 million displaced persons now, mas o menos, and um, you're, you're going to be looking at a much higher figures in, in, the, in the short term future uh, as you know, countries become more unstable uh, and as you have resource, um, uh, you know, declining resources, changing climate. And, and when you said Central America's on fire, I, 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 almost, I almost interrupted you to say, and literally, because the, the dry zone in the Northern Triangle, which is Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, is increasing. In, in intensity and in size. And Panama is now um, so bereft of water, mm. meaning rain. And this is a country that, <laughs> a jungle country, uh, that, that the, the Panama Canal is, is having a lot of trouble um, because it's fed by fresh water uh, in, in operating. So you've got multiple stressors. And one of the things I think about, I, I think that, that, that resource pressures uh, and that migration, immigration, if you want to call it that, but it's it's both I M M immigration and E M immigration. In other words, going out and coming in uh, is going to become and 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 internally displaced persons, which is a huge amount of th- that's where climate change uh, um, displacement starts. It starts with internal within a country, and then and then goes on. Just to pick a, a couple of the other threads that you brought up that are that are well, very deep d did you mind if i jump in there and just say a couple no, things please. based on that before you before you go in because I, I think you've made a couple of very important points and i just want to throw in sort of one or two thoughts on them the first is like, migration and especially in the u.s context is a perfect example of the political gridlock that i'm talking about we have needed immigration law reform in this country <laughs> since the 1980s and we don't get it not because americans don't agree that we should have it but because the factions have taken over the u.s government Um, So like a majority of Americans agree that this reform is needed, but nothing can get through Congress unless you put a China's taking over the world stamp on it or something like that. And the one thing about the United States is it is a source of tremendous power that everyone still wants to come here. Look at how tight the labor market is. Look at the demographics in the other developed or developing countries in the world. You think China doesn't wish that it could be a beacon on the hill for migrants and that they could plug in young people into their society and not face some kind of cataclysmic threat to their rule? That would be wonderful, but they can't do it. The United States can do that if it wants to. It's proven that. I'm the son of, or excuse me, the grandson of immigrants. Like this country is a country of immigrants. That's one of its greatest strengths. And we are shooting ourselves in the foot. And precisely to your point, it's not Mexicans at the border. I haven't checked in the last two months or so, but uh, it was at the end of last year for the first time in recorded history. It was Venezuelans were the largest group that were at the border because of how terrible the situation was. The second thing I wanted to say is, you know, Yes, the United States is facing a real swell of illegal migration, and it does cause challenges at the border, especially when the government hasn't thought about how to deal with them and the infrastructure and the laws and all these other things are not in place for the crisis that we're actually facing. And so it puts frontline states like Texas or like Arizona or like California in a very difficult position, having to figure out how to do things from themselves, becoming part of the national political conversation like I sympathize with it. Um, But the problems that Europe is going to be facing from Africa and in particular sub-Saharan Africa in general in the coming years is orders of magnitude worse. And I've been pretty optimistic on on the call today so far. I am not optimistic about Africa. Africa looks absolutely terrible. While we all talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Sudan's in a civil war with tens of thousands of dead, millions displaced. Ethiopia just finished fighting one civil war, might be on the verge of another. Um, There's little whispers of Rwanda and Congo and Angola and another Congolese war happening in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's a huge conflict in the late 1990s that nobody really talks about, but which millions of people literally died. And all of those indicators are flashing red and all that migration is happening and it's flowing upwards, which is why the Europeans probably have a much bigger migration problem on their hands than the United States do, because we at least have proven over history when we decide we want to, we can integrate immigrants into the economy and it can be a source of growth. And I think as the country gets older, their need will eventually force us to do that. The Europeans have never proven that they can do that. They've always othered people who don't speak their languages or who don't have their culture. So I think it's a bit, it's a much bigger threat for Europe because they have not sort of shown the institutional resilience to do 
last thing just to, and maybe you'll riff on this or go to some of the other points I made earlier. Um, the one or, or one of the leaders who seems to at least have figured something out in Central America is President Bukele in El Salvador, who is unsavory for many reasons, is probably an authoritarian, certainly is behaving and legislating like one, who with an iron fist has lowered the homicide rate significantly, has made the country far safer, um, has lessened dependence on the dollar by adopting Bitcoin when it was not popular to do so. Like deep in the trough of the crypto winter, he was still tweeting about how they were buying Bitcoin and building the volcano Bitcoin farms in El Salvador. And now he's looking pretty good too. So El Salvador, ironically enough, a beacon of stability in Central America right now. And by the way, a leader that the United States wanted nothing to do with. That's demonized right. him as an authoritarian. And yet this narco president from Honduras that is now going to spend the rest of his life in an in American jail because of a court ruling last week, when he was in office, we had no problem with him. So, I mean, just uh, interesting to me that, you know, the one country, and this is sort of depressing, the one country in Central America that seems to be having some success is El, so El Salvador, which is authoritarian. There's There's Guatemala too, which seems to have elected a leftist, progressive, anti-corruption president. But I mean, he faces a pretty intense establishment push against him. We'll have to see how things go. Maybe there's yeah. a silver lining there, but I'll, I'll hand it back off to you. I just wanted to jump in with those. points. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with all those uh, again. And, and, and it, it's the, the situation with the president of, of um, El Salvador is very interesting because he's now the, uh, the El Salvador is the model that the rest of Latin America wants to enact. And I was recently in Ecuador, and there was a lot of discussion about well, we need to be more like um, uh, more like um, El Salvador, and it's not the only country that feels that way. So, yes, it, it, it it's very interesting. But in terms of migration or immigration, you, you touched on this point, and I'll I would hit it harder, uh, which is that the only reason that the U.S. is not in the demographic crisis that Japan is in and that Europe is getting into with too many old people and not enough young people is because of immigration. And, and this is demonstrable numerically. And, um, and the other thing is we have a huge home field advantage in, in that immigration into Europe is from either mostly the Middle East or Africa. And those are places with very diff extreme differences in culture. Uh, they're different cultures. I'm not judging. And they're just very different cultures. Latin America is, is Western. It's a Western world. And, and you can drive from, you know, the Rio Grande to Tierra del Fuego. You can, you see the same cultural forms, you know, their churches, their courts, their, all these things that look familiar. You can read all the signs. And uh, I mean, the letters, you know, so it's, um, those people coming in are not culturally as distinct. That's just certainly true in Texas because we have such a strong Hispanic culture. But it's becoming true in, in the rest of the country. And it was always true because they're not an alien culture. And I hate, hate to use that word, but I don't mean it in any judgmental sense. But they're not a, a very, very different culture in the way that someone from the Middle East it, going into Europe you know, is 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 a is a true cultural um, disjunction, and so it, it, the the and and there's a third point that I'll pull out of that's an implication of what you said, and that is you're exactly right that this country has become uh, almost unmanageable because of the political differences, and um, and it it goes to this issue that we've become a people and a a at least the extremes of the parties, which are the noisy ones and the ones that have the power, think emotionally and not rationally. And I think it's 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 gotten to the this extreme for for various reasons um, that have to do with recent history. It's always been there. I mean, you know, there is evidence, there is research that humans always make decisions emotionally and then map onto them uh, rationales to, to make them feel like they're making rational, uh, um, to, to literally rationalize the, 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 uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the decisions that they've made that are actually emotional. But that emotion has been turned up 
the dial's been turned all the way. And um, it is really problematic. I don't know what you do with it. Maybe you can put your optimistic hat on it and and tell me uh, what you do with it. But yeah, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll do that. We'll do that. I, for mean, a it, it, I have something else to talk about. Go ahead. The the first thing I would say is I, I would get a little more specific with our terms because I I actually don't recognize that much of a distinction between emotions and thoughts or emotion and rationality. Like these are actually two sides of the same coin. And we call them emotions when we want to express something one way. And we call them thoughts when we want to express things another way. But thoughts are in some ways deeply held emotions and emotions are in some ways deeply held, even maybe subconscious thoughts. So I I think that that is sort of always in the back of my mind when thinking about these things. One of the things that has changed, if you look at academics who are looking at polarization in this country, is that we've always been polarized in the sense that we disagree about policy issues. But what has changed in the last really 10 or 15 years is that, and this is especially true of the politicians themselves, is demonizing the other. So we can no longer disagree with each other and still respect that that person has goodwill or is a fundamentally good person. It's, oh, you disagree with me? You're a Nazi or you're a fascist or you're a this, that, or the other thing. And it goes both ways. Honestly, the further you get- You're you're actually evil if you disagree with me. Yeah, that 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 the person that you are in citizen citizenship with, in relationship to, in your own nation, is not actually of goodwill. Doesn't actually have you know. You're assuming that they actually have sort of bad assumptions about what's going to happen, and that is true sort of at the general level. But it's especially true of politicians, and politicians continue to use that kind of rhetoric because they find that that's what gets them elected. If you actually go out and survey the American voter, or talk to the American voter, or I talk to lots of different American audiences in my travels. I find more agreement than disagreement. Uh, I was in rural Wisconsin a couple of weeks ago speaking at a dairy conference. I was expecting full-throated, you know, pro-Trump uh, sort of rhetoric. Even there, it was, God, both of these candidates suck. Is this really the best we can do? Like, I'm voting for Trump, but God, I wish we had some other option. Like, I think that's the sentiment in general in the United States. And when you look at important issues... Like most people agree that there should be some level of gun control. Most people say, well, a blanket abortion ban is probably not the way to go. There should be some conversation about what the right policy mix is to make, to compromise, to make everybody happy. It was Shelby Foote that said the great American genius was compromise and that we've lost our way sort of in a a sense of that. And the optimistic had it, it, it's not that optimistic, but I will say that we've been here three times before in U.S. history. We were here in the 1850s. We were here in the 1920s and we were here in the 1970s. Now, in the 1850s, the better angels of our nature, to quote Lincoln, didn't do so well. And we fought each other in what is still the bloodiest conflict in U.S. history, bloodier than all the other conflicts put together. The Civil War is there. Um, In the 1920s, it brought us Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal and in some ways truly the refounding of the Republic, in my opinion. And the 1970s and stagflation and the energy crisis and everything else brought us Ronald Reagan and deregulation and victory in the Cold War and all the things that set the stage for globalization and the rapid success and advancement of American power in general. The thing that bothers even me, the optimist, is that in the 1850s and the 1920s and the 1970s, the economy sucked. And the economy sucking led people to actually expressing themselves in new political blocks. So things got so bad in the 20s under Hoover that you get new coalitions of American voters who are like, I want change. We're all going to go in with this FDR guy and we're going to go where he leads. And FDR understood that it wasn't the policy mix necessarily that was important. It was about doing things. It was about making people feel confident, but actual action. And he got new tribes to basically come on with him. And the Democrats dominated for decades as a result. Ditto that Reagan in the 1980s, where he got... Nixon's silent majority to say, okay, we want change. We want this new direction. And Reagan was the one who embodied it. Um, The problem with where we are now is the economy doesn't suck at all. The economy is great. The economy is running too hot. I'm I'm not sure that the Fed is going to be able to cut this year, maybe not before the election at least. Um, And usually before you get that kind of political change where people get off their butts and actually go vote and actually say, I don't want these options. I want something different. It's usually the economy that drives them to do that. And we seem to be nowhere close. We still are hijacked by the yes. extremes of both parties sort of arguing back and forth against each other. Uh, let, let me uh, let me say something. Uh, I know we're um, we're getting close to the close here, but um, I agree with that. And I, the way I would uh, position it is that it, it's now become a politics of nostalgia. And, uh, and people want to recapture earlier forms and, and, and you know, there's this. This goes across 
uh, American society. They want they want to be originalist. They want it's make America great again, not make America greater than it's ever been. But it's it's always you know recidivist or whatever the word is. It's always about nostalgia. And I wish we had another hour to talk about political nostalgia because it's one of the most interesting and consequential forces that is at work today. And I don't think we understand it. Um, and it's it's curious for the reason you just deduced, which is that the economy is great. And usually it's been the economy that's been the engine of change. And now, uh, and, and, you know, it, 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 it's paradoxical almost. But the fact that the economy is good removes one of the pillars that people can organize change around. And um, and then I think the uh, the, cha- the amount of change itself, I think, is is making people to some extent deranged. We're not really evolved to deal with that. Um, we're also not really evolved to be always on uh, our brains. I mean, and um, and we're, and yet we are. And so, you know, it's very very problematic. As I say, I wish we had another hour. I don't know how much longer we have. A few minutes, maybe. But um, yeah. Hey, D, I'm going to I'm going to jump in here um, before we start a, n- a new thought. Um, we've got a couple of questions, but I'm going to pose one to both of you. Is the economy great for everyone? Um, if you're young and you are facing, you know, a university that's impossible to afford student loans, can't buy a house, can't, you know, don't know what career to do because AI is probably going to wipe it out. I think this is a, some of what comes up in the conversations we have here is if it's really good economy if you have a job and you have assets and you're of a certain age. But if you're young and you don't, and the problem with those people forming a political block is that they're losing faith in the system. And around the world, less and less young people are engaging in the democratic process anywhere. Um, and Jacob, I know Cognitive has done some stuff on the YOLO economy. That's why they're 10Xing on meme stocks because they're just like, you know, it's part of why we 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 named this series uh, what we did is because they feel like they're screwed and they're kind of, you know, it's it's creating, D, to your point, a cultural problem. So the stepping up in in service and running and reforming political parties, some people are just not sure that's the way. Um, and maybe they're looking for a completely, not just new party, but a new system, which is a very daunting thought for all of us because we don't know what that looks like. I'm just curious how either of you feel about that because that's it's something that comes up in conversation with our audience. Yeah, I well, mean, I, I, I would agree that um, they're not, they're in a terrible position and um, for many reasons. And we haven't even gotten into climate change really and, and resource depletion and so forth. But the, the economy is great when you're using the metrics that we use to measure it. If you use other metrics, then it's not. It, it, and, and of course, we are stuck in a, a, another incumbent system here. Uh, of, uh, here's how we measure what GDP is. Here's how we measure what inflation is. And, and, and they're, they're, they're selective and they're not really even accurate. And, um, and so, you know, we're, we're, when, when I think Jacob and I, I'm not going to speak for Jacob, but he's here and he speak for himself. But, when 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 we say it's great, what we mean is that by the definitions that the um, that the establishment call it that the financial establishment uses the metrics that they use, it it scores on on all those metrics or many of them. Uh, but no, it is miserable for many people. Uh, hence the I- I- enormous rise in in uh, use of fentanyl and things like that and suicide. Uh, loneliness so, you know, epidemic. It's great if it's great for you, but if it's not. But, but Jacob, what what do you think? Well, I I might say that loneliness has more to do with social media. Like before, we would have all been doing this in person, and instead, I'll go back to my lonely office, yeah. and you'll go back to keep us. <laughs> and Maggie will go back to her lonely office. I I would say very simply, the economy is never good for everyone. That's just the way yeah. it works. Sometimes people are going to be a bottom. Sometimes people are going to be on the top. If you are a young person who locked in a mortgage at two percent. Uh, from 2020 to 2022, you're doing great. Like there's never going to be a better investment opportunity than buying real estate in the United States with a mortgage at 2%. So, I mean, it just sort of depends where you are in the cycle. Things can always look terrible. I'll tell you, this is also one area in which I think that young Chinese people and young Americans and really young people, no matter where they are in the world, have something in common. 
because there's this idea that you have to be self-actualized in your job, that your job doesn't just supply your income. It also supplies the meaning that you derive from mm. life. And that's something cultural. That has nothing to do with sort of the structural economic forces that are there. I see the labor market is super tight. Productivity is going up. Wages are going up. Inequality is going down. Now, are the jobs that young people want there? No. And this is why I say go to the Chinese market. China was having trouble filling jobs in positions at ports or in the shipping industry, really critical industries to the economy because everybody wanted to go work for a Tencent or an Alibaba or some tech company because the tech companies are cool. That's where you want to go if you want to make a bunch of money and sit around in the beanbag chairs and have the massage therapists and whatever <laughs> else they have at the Google Hangouts and some things like that. So I, I wouldn't really, I don't really take that stuff much seriously. And, and I and I, and I will start taking it seriously the moment young people, and I'm in this generation, in a generation yeah. that has not voted, the moment they start voting, I chair and start paying attention. But if they can't be even bothered to go vote in an election that will actually change some of these structural economic problems, that sounds like sour grapes and not the level of real economic challenge that I'm talking about that creates systemic political change. In the that, 1920s, things were really bad. Yeah. Everybody voted because their futures were dependent on it. That's not where we are now. There's a I lot think of that's wine. so interesting because somebody, somebody very, a very present, uh, present conversation I had a few years ago said it will be voter turnout. These young people are now eligible to vote in numbers they never have been before. We haven't seen that, right? We haven't seen the impact that will have, which brings us to Paul's question. Um, it's a big one, so you're going to have to pick one part of it to answer. But what do you see for the U.S. the next four years under Trump versus Biden. Jacob, this is your point about this political uncertainty um, in the U.S. kind of creating a lot of concern around the world because we just can't came out. But what do you see yeah. as the as I the mean, difference aside from are, protectionism? Well, there's so many aspects of this and a lot of it, like I'm not in Donald Trump's head. I'm not even sure Donald Trump knows what's in Donald Trump's head. I don't know head. that He's anybody very... could make that claim, by the way. Yeah. So I, I find him very hard to predict. What, what I know is that is what he has said. And what he and his minions and his policy statements have said is that he's considering blanket 10% tariffs on every country in the world and up to, and up to 60% tariffs on imports specifically from China. Can he do that legally? Will he actually do it because of the... Con we can get into a conversation about that. That's what he's out there saying he's going to do. Um, and in addition, I think there was uh, Victor Orban said he met with Trump. Uh, what was it? Or, yeah, today and said, oh, he's also going to stop funding the Russia Ukraine war. Maybe. I don't know. That's sort of uh, you'll have to see. But I think that's the biggest difference um, because Biden is not talking about that. Biden wants to be very surgical with his protectionism, but he also wants to build relationships with American allies in Europe and the Pacific, things like that. And those are diametrically opposed worldviews. If Trump gets into office and he does that, even if he can only do it for a certain amount of time before it's challenged by the legal system, you ain't seen nothing yet with inflation. Just imagine if just the China parts of the tariffs go through. Uh, inflation is going to go through the roof. And then maybe we'll get a deflationary crisis sort of after it. So I'm trying to take Trump. And the thing that pops off the page to me is what is what is 60 percent tariffs on all imports from China? mean for the U.S. economy, which, again, not what anybody else is discussing, right? But like that to me is the most tangible thing that will actually affect people's pocketbooks, their investments, all those other sorts of things. Yeah, and D, I want to get your thoughts. It would be foolhardy to not take everything he says at face value because that's what people did the first time around and he actually did it all, you know, or he tried to do it all. So this idea that it's just a campaign, campaign rhetoric, I don't think that that's a wise, uh, you know, thought process to operate under. D, your thoughts? I would agree with everything that Jacob said, but I would add to it that I think Trump is very angry right now and, and for the foreseeable future. He is very threatened uh, with various kinds of lawsuits, as we all know, uh, and, and it's, it's having an effect on his money in, in a big way. And so I think that he is more likely to lash out um, in the in the foreseeable future, as anyone is who's angry, you know, it's not particular to Trump. Um, and that could take the form of, of uh, military uh, adventurism. Um, and so I, the way I look at it is that that Biden represents uh, and th this is where, the, where it comes where the, you know, the rubber hits the road for me, that, that Biden represents uh, a nostalgia for the recent past, the world of the liberal international order, the world of globalization, the world of, of uh, you know, um, political 
nicety more than we have now, and that uh, Trump represents a nostalgia for the for an imagined past, but it's it's a farther back past. It's a past of white America. It's a past of you know of of, of a whole bunch of structures that we we think we've moved away from, and they both represent a kind of nostalgia. What I'm not seeing is anybody who's thinking outside the box and saying, look, these old systems we have are no longer relevant. They're in a posit. They're, they don't work. They're not going to get us from A to Z or even A to B. And, uh, and, and we need to rethink this. And that, I think, is what a lot of young people are saying. And I actually agree with it because I, I think we, that, that you know all the, this, this continuum of systems that are all the product of, of, of 18th century um, enlightenment thought, um, you know, communism, socialism, capitalism, the, the, you know, the, the, it's all one piece based on a certain kind of materialist prosperity. And uh, that is, is we're, we're coming up to a change in that. And I don't see any of these older politicians, and I'm well past the century, half century mark. And so I can say this, they are way too old. And um, we need fresh thinking in there. And I think young people would get involved if they could see that there were some new ideas and we need them. So. Yeah. Well, and I, I would just joke that, I mean, that's what RFK Jr. is trying to do. And his problem is just that he's nuts. <laughs> yeah. he's there, 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 uh, we, and, you know, it, it is um, it's a, a little bit of a catch 22, isn't it, of Jacob, because they're not voting young people, but they're not voting because they can't believe these are the only two choices. And yet this is somehow, and to your point about what the voters in Wisconsin were telling you, almost everywhere you go, certainly every every conversation I have, even though I try to stay away from politics, is that like, this is it? How did we end up back here? So maybe a question that we'll have to pick up next time is, is does, does a major change needed in the actual political system uh, mm-hmm. that we we find ourselves back here again? Because it seems like absolutely no one wants this. Um, and so it's, it's a, very a old. conundrum that everyone's in this year. It's very old, and it, it and it just it doesn't you know the the most recent of these concept conceptual systems uh, it was invented in the mid nineteenth century, which is is uh, communism and socialism, and so it's just not it, they're they're too old, like just like the politicians, and both Trump and Biden are too old. It's just old think, and it's just not going to work. But we have to figure we have to find that out. By the painful process, uh, you know, uh, my grandmother always said, only a fool learns from experience. You should learn from other people's experience. But we're going to have to, once again, go through these things and, and learn that we have to make some changes. If anyone hasn't seen our life in uh, my life in four trades, the one Dee and I did, you'll know his grandmother was a very wise woman. <laughs> so we should take that <laughs> advice to heart. Um, we could go on and on for hours on this. We just scratched the surface, but it's a it's a great um, political backdrop for tackling why everyone is feeling so out of sorts and just feeling like it's so hard to get it get ahead. We wanted to do the first week really unravel some of these challenges, and the second week dive into how we can address this. So, D, we're going to put that on the list. Like, do we need a new system? What does that look like? This old way of thinking has to go. Thank you both, um, Jacob and Dave. Fantastic conversation. Um, like I said at the beginning, we want to hear what you think. There were some questions that we didn't get to, um, which we will, we're going to hang on to all of them. We're going to be looking at them in the comment section of the video and also the event channel. We're going to be going through them. Um, and I'm going to do a special with Raul next week. We're going to sit down and wrap it up. Um, so we'll be pulling from that as well as a live daily briefing and discussion on uh, the Friday and in workshops too. So roll up with all of them. We're going to keep the conversation going all week. Tomorrow we have Andreas and Dario Perkins pulling the lid back on central banks and everything that's going on there. Thursday, we tackle real estate. There was a question about that in the chat. So tune in for that. Friday, we're going to have a macro overview with Julian Brigton and Tavi Costa. By that time, you should have a handle on all of the challenges and we'll spend week two talking about what we can all do about it. So we're looking forward to it. Thanks everybody. Take care and good luck. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.